Well, thank you. you re I cannot see a thing here. I, all I can see is this bright light. Michael, I, you're going to have the same, same effect when you're standing here. Good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Vic Liptak. Most of you know me in uh, various capacities. Um, I'm a SciArc alumna. I'm an instructor at times, and I help out in the shop. I came to know our speaker this evening, Michael Pride Wells, through a project offered to the woodshop about a year ago uh, regarding architecture. The firm that Michael is the founding principal of contacted the shop last October uh, to see if we were interested in offering a design build course for a play structure. You know, slide swings, kids running around, that kind of stuff. Uh, Randall Wilson, our shop master, it was extremely busy at the time, as always, um, but also looking out for the best interests of his staff, suggested that I might become involved with the project. Um, and from all of that arose a course, and this past summer I organized and taught a workshop, um, Child's Play in South Central, to design and build that play structure for a Head Start preschool in South Central. This is all as part of a project that Michael's working on, uh, the Somerville Mixed Use Development at the old Dunbar Hotel in South Central. Um, let me say first that I was drawn to the opportunity uh, to do this kind of a course as soon as I heard that regarding architecture was a socially responsible design firm. Socially responsible, you know, even just responsible. Uh, I had uh, wondered about socially responsible architects. You know, who were they? Um, could they find work in Los Angeles? And what did their work look like? In fact, what is the whole responsibility thing? It's a, it's a very, very popular word at thesis time. You know, socially responsible, environmentally responsible, fiscally responsible when you take project and office management. So recently I asked Michael what socially responsible meant to her in her work, in the clients who seek her out, and the projects that she takes on. Is it just chance that the bulk of her work involves community planning, development, and redevelopment? No, it's not chance. Uh, Michael has built her practice on the principle of responsiveness to the project owners and users with the aim of realizing community goals. Michael and her firm seek to expand the emerging role of architects within the community. Before she founded Regarding Architecture in 1990, she was already beginning to formulate these community-based ideas. But she told me that it was really following the riots in Los Angeles that she began to actively pursue work to serve the community. And so this is, this is all a conscious effort on the part of regarding architecture. Um, Michael's success can be seen in the number of publications her work appears in. For example, PA, Avatari, Architecture, and uh, by the way, I believe that Michael is our only speaker this semester who appears in the August 95 issue of Ebony in a, an article on top women architects. Her success is also seen in uh, numerous awards for design excellence and community service. In the juries, she's been asked to serve on both for competitions and in academia. Uh, in many lectures and keynote addresses, she's been asked to give just in the last three years. I, carefully read her um, curriculum vitae, and it's pretty extensive. Um, and also in her commitment to education. Michael teaches um, architectural studios and seminars at Woodbury in their very fine architecture program. And in fact, I believe many members of her class are here this evening, and we welcome you. Uh, she also was a visiting faculty member for two years at UCLA. And all of this gives me the great pleasure and honor to introduce Michael Pride Wells as she speaks on Practicing what you preach. Good evening, and thank you, Vic. Um, it's always amazing to kind of hear yourself described because you wonder who is that person and when did I have time to be that person. Um, and I also want to uh, thank a lot of friends who I know are here tonight. I really appreciate your filling out the room a little bit. And <laughs> um, my students for showing up and, uh, 
and also, uh, most importantly, are some people who help me a lot, and that includes Barbara Ellis, a SciArt graduate, um, and an associate at Regarding Architecture. I'm probably Chin Kim is here, my intern, and um, Ed Liu, and other people. You guys know what it's really like and uh, have stuck through it all. I also want to thank OJ for canceling his scheduled interview tonight. And <laughs> <laughs> so that maybe more of you would be here. Anyway, and so then I don't miss it whenever he decides to do that. So <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm, it's really a pleasure to be here and to share with you some of kind of the work that I've been doing over the last few years and the thoughts that I've had about it. Um, it's kind of what it is, why I do it, um, what it means to me how it might be influenced by who and what I am, how it changes me philosophically, how it affects my practice, and even how you might do uh, some work that's more meaningful to you, kind of socially responsible things. And um, you know, these are the questions that I ask myself. And so preparing this lecture has really given me the opportunity to try to answer that even for me, as well as for you. Um, I also got to experiment with PowerPoint, so yeah, I hope you'll indulge my slides. Uh, I first gave this lecture in, at the University of Kentucky earlier this year, and you know they, they have to schedule these things so far in advance, and months before my scheduled lecture, they asked me what I was going to title it, and I said, well, um, I don't know, give me a day and, uh, to think about it, and I just called back and said, well, how about practicing what you preach? It just kind of seemed okay. But then, I thought after I thought about it and I was preparing to actually write this lecture and thinking about how it was going to be organized, I, re I remembered that Kentucky is like in the Bible Belt. And how could I pick a title with the word preach in it? So <laughs> it took on a whole new meaning. I began to think about the nature of practice versus the nature of preaching. And it occurred to me that professional practice is an activity that is based really on learned and known factors. Um, it's skill, it's physical, it's tangible, um, it has to do with expertise, etc. And that practicing is really an act of faith, a belief in something largely unknown and intangible. It is more emotional than intellectual, more spiritual than physical more intuitive than analytical. I think that my work and my practice can also be characterized that way. With an accredited degree, a license, and over 15 years of experience, I like to think that I also offer some acquired skill and ability to make the most of these kind of more emotional traits. I apply both the skills and the, the traits to architecture and planning, design, parenting, and volunteering to and from all aspects of my life. I am political, social, very opinionated, thoughtful, committed, and educated, but not academic. I have to learn how to use the slide thing, too. Um, let's see. My, my motivation is emotional. My process is intuitive. My influences are circumstantial. My teachers are not tenured. So I won't be quoting theorists, research data, trends, or formalist dictum. It's just me, just my stuff, just the people I do it for. So while I began to study and analyze the work and its motivations and all of that, I still want to maintain this kind of essential um, intuitive nature of it. To do so, I have to stop apologizing for the lack of rigorous intellectual inquiry and take a position. I am an anti-academic. This is sort of like those academics who are non-architects. Steeped in research and theoretical discourse, they have failed to pass the, the licensing exam. And one of these days, I'll pass the slide exam. OK. After a few unsuccessful attempts, they take a philosophical position. 
Oh, see, I backed up. And, did I miss one there, you guys? There, that was the one you were supposed to see before. Okay. No, don't keep going backwards. I'll get used to this in a minute. By about nine, we should have it under control. Okay. Anti-architects. They declare the invalidity of licensure, the triteness of practice, the commonness of building, and promote the value of highly theoretical, intangible, intellectual exploration. Come to think of it, maybe they're a little like preachers. Anyway, the work I will share with you tonight is not theory, new towns, or paper architecture. This is real work for real people living real lives. There, there are some people. It, it does include buildings, but also includes neighborhoods, p political and social policy, architectural activism, and response to an existing urban condition. It represents collabor collaboration and participation by a broad spectrum of people. Po they include politicians, developers, residents, business owners, contractors, planners, and even a few architects. It can generally be classified as social architecture and urban planning or urban design. 80% um, of what I know about urban planning, I learned from the people who are the communities in which I work. I learned about 10% of it from colleagues and conferences and a mere 5% from architecture school. As a matter of fact, only 30% of what I know about architecture came from architecture school. About 20% of it comes from the opportunity to teach it, kind of have to learn it all over again, and 50% comes from doing it. Some of whatever, I know, of whatever I know about anything is a result of genetic and environmental factors, being black, being a woman, being a social democrat, being the daughter of my parents, one of whom's an architect, the other one is an activist, I guess I'd call her, and being from and of Los Angeles. So here I am, already I've declared myself an anti-academic, and here I am at SciArc talking about preaching or something. Um, I don't know how all that comes together in this place at this time, but we'll just kind of uh, pursue it anyway. The riots that shocked Los Angeles in 1992 also shocked and changed me even more than the subsequent 7.0 earthquake. The causes and effects were widespread and deeply felt. I realized that the world hadn't changed all that much, not even in Los Angeles. And I think the recent O.J. Simpson case gives us yet another example of how little has changed between us. Racism, economic inequality, and despair still rule the lives of so many. I feared for the life of my nephews. They are young adults, and black, and they were on the streets, possibly after curfew. I feared for the life of my son. There he is. He was only two years old at the time, but he, he was and still is black and male and probably facing the same disadvantages and stereotypes as my nephews. I feared for the future of Los Angeles and the future of my community, my black community and uh, ethnic community and my LA community. I cried. I also had to ask, what can I do to help make a difference? Fortunately, other architects, planners, engineers, and designers asked the same of themselves, and the Design Professionals Coalition was born just two weeks later. We met every week in an attempt to coordinate resources and information to work together toward a design response to make sure that that response looked like and understood the affected communities. Three years later, the DPC is an incorporated nonprofit providing volunteer design services to neglected neighborhoods, advocating public policy that empowers them, and is committed to community-based solutions. My involvement in the DPC led to my, to my involvement in all of the projects I'll share with you, probably all of the projects that I do, I think. Um, volunteering really changed my life and my practice.
Our interest and activity quickly expanded beyond the sites that were directly affected by the riots. Um, and to, we began to serve and embrace individuals, organizations, and neighborhoods that were located within the affected areas and other neglected neighborhoods that might not otherwise have access to design services. One of our early, more visible projects is the rehabilitation of St. Elmo Village, an artist community in Midtown LA. It's largely black and low income and provides retreat and, and arts instruction for the surrounding communities and beyond. They've been uh, very involved with the school districts as well. The village was founded shortly after the Watts riots of 1965 when Rozelle Sykes and his nephew Roderick Sykes formed St. Elmo, St. Elmo Village, Inc and began to acquire this property that you see here. It became a sensory and spiritual wonderland that includes 11 turn-of-the-century bungalows, seven resident painters, photographers and musicians, several guest instructors, neighborhood kids and families, and uh, devoted alumni and some celebrity friends. With time and minimal resources, however, the facilities have deteriorated. With substandard or non-functioning structural, mechanical, and electrical systems, failing roofs, etc., You see, they knew it. Because of their nonprofit status and their low rents, they were able to secure uh, funding through the Los Angeles um, Housing Department to rehabilitate the residential units. However, the funding was based on conventional work plan that included system upgrades, but did not begin to address the spirit, character, and function of the place as artists live workspace. It, it also did not include the common workshop areas and the outdoor spaces. The DPC agreed to fill a kind of a gap, and our project goals were to preserve the original and evolved character of the village, its rich landscaping, deep colors, ever-changing artwork from found materials usually, the incredible asphalt mural, and the messages that were everywhere. We wanted to provide architectural guidelines for the funded rehabilitation and the other common spaces that might be funded later and also to consider opportunities to expand the village. Um, our goal was to document the proposals in a form that might attract additional support and funding, so in a way we could act as a catalyst not only to kind of indicate the work, but to advertise it and, um, and, a, and solicit more support for the project and for the village programs. Monique Biro who some of you may know, is the former, she's a SciArc alumnus and a dear friend of mine, um, and I worked, we acted as the project managers for the DPC project. We conducted a 24-hour charrette over a weekend in January of 93. Over 50 volunteers participated. They included residents of the village, the neighbors, uh, the teachers, the um, students from um, students from USC who had adopted the project uh, for a studio with Jeff Chusid, um, landscape architecture students from Cal Poly Pomona, landscape architects, engineers, historians, the contractor, and other friends. The weekend was really wonderful and intense. It was spiritual, it was energized, um, and it included creative music breaks, uh, communal meals, and teeth chattering cold. It was really cold. We discovered how much they needed, um, they needed insulation in the workshops uh, by doing this in January. The collective concentrated energy and expertise brought by the charrette yielded far more than the stated project goals. The gas company was invited to observe and later committed its weatherization program to training local residents for part of the construction donating fixtures and weatherization material, and printing the final charrette document. The press came back repeatedly to the village for the first time in years. Participants formed relationships and connections that continue today. Jackie and Roderick's work is hanging in my office, while the, in, kind of in storage, while the construction um, go, is being completed. It's almost done, though, but I think I've convinced them 
uh, that they can't really take the work out. And if they want to take any particular pieces, then they have to replace them with others. So that's worked out pretty well. And here's Jackie on the left, Jackie Alexander, the secretary of um, St. Elmo Village, Inc., and, and Roderick Sykes, the president of St. Elmo Village, Inc. And both of them are artists, as you may have guessed, uh, but also they're both collaborating with architects a lot more on projects. And so that's been an interesting change for them. Monique and I have become villagers for life, which is a great benefit. And of course, by the way, some of the rehab work got done. And you see this, this change is very subtle, but it's very meaningful to this place. And we also hope to participate in a kind of a paint in or something to restore the mural. You see now the asphalt is all gone and will be replaced with new concrete paving. But we'll have to go in and paint it to make it um, more village-like. I was asked to help develop the Crenshaw Neighborhood Plan, um, which was part of a, a project uh, that spun off out of, after the riots or in response to the riots in 10 neighborhoods across Los Angeles. I was tempted to turn down this paid commission because I didn't feel I had a lot of formal training in planning and, and knew the, the right things to do at the right time and all that stuff. My staff reminded me that I probably would have done it for free anyway, so why shouldn't I just get paid something for it? So <laughs> after a while of going back and forth and trying to suggest to the planning group that they hire somebody else or I could give them a list of other people, I agreed to take it. As I said, the project was one of 10 neighborhood plans that were developed um, and commissioned by the Coalition of Neighborhood Developers, a collaboration of more than 40 community-based nonprofits working in neglected communities of Los Angeles. Um, they also got some additional funding from, or some modest, I should say, from Local Initiative Support Corporation and Los Angeles Community Development Department. Uh, each neighborhood plan was directed by a local committee of nonprofits that serve that particular geographic area. As community planner for the Crenshaw District, I worked to write the plan, not to, not to write it actually, but to facilitate its writing. Over 400 residents, homeowners, business owners, community-based developers, public agencies, students, and design professionals, all volunteers, participated in over 100 hours of intuitive planning uh, to develop the final document. We worked together using the charrette technique uh, to imagine and determine a possible future for this very proud community. The Crenshaw District is the last statistical and cultural bastion of the black community within Los Angeles. Uh, politically, the district includes portions of three LA City Council districts and an unincorporated portion of the county. And you can kind of see that illustrated um, on the diagram to the left. It includes the rich architectural heritage of the Village Green and Lamarck Park developments, but has been largely ignored in recent years. Once a thriving retail and automobile center, commercial activity along, along Crenshaw Boulevard has deteriorated. It serves largely as a vehicular connector to the freeway and points beyond the district. The street is currently being considered for development of rail transportation, however. Uh, Crenshaw was also affected by the riots, leaving people uncertain and determined to act in defense of their community. We conducted a total of five charrettes in Crenshaw, uh, four weekend long, kind of 24 to 30 hour things uh, with what we'll call the adults. And later we had a one day session for junior and, and high school students that was very successful. Um, the results in general were really great. I think besides coming up with an actual plan, something that you can read and look at pictures and whatever, there are a lot of, again, a lot of uh, side effects that may be even more meaningful than the plan itself. Um, here we had residents and business owners who met each other and learned more about their own community. They worked side by side and they heard what um, government agencies had planned for them. Uh, they organized around policy and development issues. I just have to point out my dear friend, 
uh, Bob Locke, also a SciArc a, a Sci graduate on the left. I'm going to take a minute to remember him. Um, volunteer design professionals acted with, not for, community to clarify needs and concerns. They translated them into initiatives and described them in written and graphic form. Government agencies and city council offices took ownership of the plan and its participatory process, promoting its goals and strategies. The plan was incorporated into the city's community plan for the area, and the planning process was included in um, MOCA's Urban Revisions exhibit that was here last year. In a kind of a follow-up and related project, I joined a team of consultants led by uh, Doug Sussman in Public Works Design to, to the Lonnie Projects. This is the local, uh, the Los Angeles Neighborhood Initiative that uh, was initiated by the, by the mayor's office. Lonnie identified eight neighborhood centers for a demonstration improvement project. I was the liaison for Lamert Park. Uh, you see the park on the right, which is the cultural heart of the Crenshaw District. With $250,000 seed money from the FTA, each of the, com uh, each of the communities conceptualized a plan for transit-related improvements, which would act to reinforce and enhance existing neighborhood places. So here you see the places and uh, kind of their existing transit and public, um, public place accessories and enhancements, um, just kind of your regular bus stop and shelter. How about that one? That looks pretty nice. Public telephones. This project looks at everything from streetscape and, tr and tree plantings to, um, to uniquely providing various amenities like, um, like telephones, in a different way, or like trees that aren't there. Banners and other projects. Okay. Um, there, these, this project is now in its third phase as they prepare to go into construction, and they think they already had bidding on this, these projects. And many of the neighborhoods have already started implementing their plans by having community tree plantings and uh, banner design contests in local schools that will um, provide the logos for these districts. If you've noticed, we've been progressing from free to a little bit of money to maybe a whole commission, and that's where we are now. And um, this isn't a lot of money, so the word is still kind of small. Uh, as president of the Design Professionals Coalition, I was helping initiate the neighborhood planning in, in Vernon Central uh, before I was hired in Crenshaw even. Being there helped to lead to an actual paying project, the Somerville Developments. And this was something that Vic mentioned, and that Vic is now Vic and the school, and many of some of you possibly are involved in now. The Vernon Central neighborhood was the heart of Black Los Angeles until the covenant restrictions were lifted in the 1960s. It was home to many Black businesses and community leaders. The Somerville Hotel and nearby jazz clubs on Central Avenue were home away from home to many Black celebrities. And this is the interior, uh, the lobby of the hotel back in the early 30s, and the uh, drugstore counter, uh, soda counter. John Somerville, one of the first black graduates of USC's dentistry school, built the hotel in 1929. It was the only hotel that would serve black clientele. So even though in, um, uh, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, and others were coming to Los Angeles and performing in the Ambassador Hotel and other places. They couldn't actually stay in the hotel or even walk in the front door. They came and stayed at um, the Somerville, which later became the Dunbar Hotel. The Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, which is the first black-owned insurance company west of the Mississippi, built their first headquarters within a year of the hotel 
the hotel's construction just a half a block away. It was designed by James Garrett, one of LA's early black architects, and you see the building. It's not quite in its original form, but certainly better than it is now on the left. The street is now largely neglected and abandoned. The neighborhood is 75% Hispanic. Housing units are overcrowded. Services are almost non-existent. Dunbar EDC, however, that's Dunbar Economic Development Corporation, has um, restored and rehabilitated the renamed Dunbar Hotel on the left to house elderly and, and disabled residents, and they're bar embarking upon a historic renaissance program to commemorate and celebrate the corridor's vibrant past. Launching this program, we have under construction, uh, since early this year, 39 new housing units for families, mostly large families, 4,000 square feet of storefront retail space, and the GSM building, the Golden State Mutual building here, will be rehabilitated to provide two residential units and a Head Start preschool. And um, it's, it's there at the preschool that um, the SciArc play structure will be installed uh, hopefully early in actually January, Vic, January 96, or December 95. The project has to respond to several concerns, historic context, cultural history, social reality, and I guess aesthetics, too. Uh, this project was designed in collaboration with Ina Dubnoff, also familiar to some people here at SciArc. Uh, together with the client, uh, we were committed to, to a project that included retail storefront and kind of original streetscape scale, despite arguments and zoning that would have precluded the building type and siting. Uh, the design intent was to, to provide the uses and density necessary to render the project economically feasible and socially viable, while responding to concerns of scale um, and the historic character of the street. In general, also, we'd found in the neighborhood planning process that uh, a lot of communities were very concerned about large apartment blocks. And so we tried to break down the scale by setting the, um, setting the retail right up on the street front, setting the residential back, and trying to create at least the illusion of smaller buildings at the, um, for the residential upper floors. Here in the, hey, maybe I could even use this pointer. Right there, that's the Golden State Mutual Building in, in the way we hope it will look. Um, and this, this is an old design scheme, but it kind of shows you the basic ideas of, of the project. We wanted to create a sense of community within the housing portions and to create safe play spaces, laundry, and community meeting space. We also wanted to humanize the space by including landscape inside and out on all levels of the building with opportunities for gardening and gathering. We just have some nice little filler slides here. <laughs> and here on the right actually is, um, is a mural that was done by a local artist and it has been hanging on the side of the Sentinel building, which uh, is the black newspaper in Los Angeles, for those of you who don't know, which is going to be torn down, this building, all, despite all attempts to try to save it as part of this historic corridor. Uh, so we've made a commitment in, uh, in the Somerville projects to install this mural on one of, on the, uh, one of the buildings, one of the residential buildings, so that's neat. So now, in retrospect, I can make some observations about this work um, and answering some of, the uh, some of the questions that I mentioned in the beginning about what it is. It's probably not this, which is uh, beautiful shots in Kentucky. <laughs> that, you know, it's, it's so unlike Los Angeles, I get a chance to use it here. Okay. Um, so what, what it is. It's more about process than its product or style. While I appreciate and may even subs subscribe to particular formal architectural systems, I see them only as tools for doing the work of making places and neighborhoods. 
Architecture is one part of a social system, and design has an important influence on people and other living things. We are inspired by our environment, either to achieve or to fail to try, to be content or to rebel. Why I do it, how, and how it might be influenced by who and what I am. I realize now that this is what I had hoped architecture would be, though I could not have described it for you even when I started school or finished school or started practicing. Even before architecture, I wanted to be of service, whether as an attorney, a judge, or a research chemist. We could probably uh, strike out that, the, that attorney and judge thing after the last few weeks. But anyway, I did and do want to work with other people, be a valuable member of a team, and to contribute to an improved quality of life. I'm not sure where those values come from, but I'm sure they're influenced by my background and my upbringing bringing, and maybe by my astrological sign, and I don't know, whatever I did wrong in my past lives. More of Kentucky. This is my backyard, I wish. Uh, what it means to me. I see the practice of architecture as a public social service. Architecture at its best goes beyond art and object making, beyond science and physics, beyond shelter and construction using all these elements to interpret and hold the expectations and aspirations of people in their everyday and extraordinary lives. It's such a positive activity. The practice of law, back to that law thing, seems to be based on conflict. The practice of medicine is based on illness. Both are responses to negative conditions and usually have some unpleasant result, surgery or something. Um, architecture taps into the optimistic side of the human psyche even when attempting to repair or revitalize ailing urban conditions. Architects are facilitators with the ability to translate those aspirations into physical space. How it changes me personally. I become more of a generalist, uh, not, in, not in that I can or want to design everything, but that I consciously bring everything and everyone, probably, everything that I am and do and know to what I do design or plan. It's a holistic approach rather than a renaissance attitude. How it has affected my practice. My commitment to community issues has been reinforced by the work we have been doing. It causes me to seek more of this work and actually we kind of reject work that isn't along, the, isn't community serving. While I've never been interested in designing high rises, it's now a phil philosophical position. Um, the work we pursue and do includes affordable housing, whether it's multifamily re rental for nonprofit developers or for individuals with limited budgets, and those are my friends. Uh, child care facilities, that's a favorite type. Uh, historic and cultural rehabilitation and restoration and planning on a community or neighborhood scale that is largely, uh, has a lot to do with community participation. Um, so, the, some of the work that we're doing now would go in that context, including a child care center that was recently completed construction in Compton at the transit center there. This is really a TI job, uh, but we did it. It was a design-build contract with two more construction. And uh, Barbara and I went to go try to shoot this quickly last week. Uh, this is its best form so far, but it still has no children in it. Uh, they're finishing up some, uh, some of the construction issues, and I think we have to go in and arrange the furniture the way we would like and uh, also get some kids in there. But we got to have some fun with uh, color because we had to use really cheap materials. This project was turned around. Uh, we went from authorization to proceed to approve design in one week. We used the charrette process uh, to work with the clients and others to, ar to arrive at the basic uh, programmatic conditions and then went and worked intensively back at the office for a couple of days. And, uh, but it was really great because it really, the essence of the project is still there because we don't have time to, to mess it up. Um, I don't know if you can appreciate it with the furniture in, but we certainly don't want to photograph it without the furniture. Uh, but we, as I said, we used, used really cheap materials, just drywall, paint, and um, VCT. 
and a lot of the stuff was existing. It was designed, build, and turned around very quickly. Oh, we had a little bit of fun with angles, I guess. <clears throat> okay. Um, we also, let's see, how it has affected my work uh, can be broken down into four categories. One is people. We collaborate. There are more people involved earlier in the process. As I said, with the, we use the charrette as a model, and um, we get everybody, try to get all the stakeholders in one place at the very beginning of the project. We have, we have enhanced genuine appreciation and respect for the concerns of, and roles of, of those involved in a given project. Uh, site and place. I now acknowledge proactively that a project site extends well beyond its property lines to include, to affect, and to be affected by the neighborhood around it. Um, the, the, this project just kind of shows you where. Uh, Morningside Park in Inglewood is a project, we, the revitalization study we're working on with uh, David Denton and we're consultants to Vermont Slauson Economic Development Corporation to come up with some kind of analysis and ideas for future of this neighborhood. Um, the commercial district of um, of Inglewood. It was a former commercial district along Manchester Boulevard and very near the Forum, but has been kind of left alone. It's very interesting, though, because we found that it has a very rich architectural heritage in the streamlined modern style, and we're working on architectural guidelines and urban design um, concepts to capitalize on that existing um, that existing base. And you can see here how I think when you don't, we find a lot in um, many of these lower income or ethnic neighborhoods that there hasn't been much economic motivation to change things. So you find, you know, all the neon intact, all the detail intact, although Owl Drugs is no longer in the Owl Drugs building, um, there's been no motivation to take the sign down and put up a big new save on sign or something like that, even though there's a market inside. And um, we're also looking at um, issues on the streetscape to kind of um, uh, make it more pedestrian friendly. You see there was a streetscape program a few years ago, but it, so it was just kind of an, a city-wide streetscape program and didn't really respond to the character and place of this particular district. So we're looking at that. And uh, one day we'll have after shots to show you on these. Process. That's the third thing. We have, uh, as I said, we've adopted the charrette as a strategy for all project design and startup. As part of an effective, efficient, team building, collaborative, and partnering philosophy of project delivery. It improves project design and quality, bringing all factors to bear at once and in agreement. It forces consensus to the project team that includes owner, architect, engineer, and regulating agencies the users, the neighbors, and the funders. It intensifies the design experience, I'm sure as you all know, those of you especially who are in school at the moment, uh, with a collective energy and concentration that exceeds the sum of the individual efforts. We can turn projects around more effectively and efficiently and resolve challenges more easily with a cooperative spirit and when everybody's there at one time. The fourth, the fourth, um, categories product. Uh, I often lamented and even contemplated graduate school um, several years ago because I didn't think, because uh, I had not developed a signature architectural style. I now recognize and celebrate the fact that the work that, the work that we do is so influenced by the people for whom it is designed that, um, that we let it stand at that. We provide the tools, the planning, design, and or construction knowledge to generate a level of aesthetic and social quality beyond what might otherwise result. That quality is defined by its ability to support and celebrate its function and its users, its limited, imp its limited impact on the environment, and its respect for its neighborhood, both the physical and cultural neighborhoods. So, 
how you might do what is meaningful to you. Well, this is, I'll end with a plea, I guess, as long as we're preaching, to those for whom this work resonates, for those of you who will carry on the work of architecture or social architecture, please remember this. Be open and accessible. Listen to others. Care about what you hear. Speak English. Design with your brain and your heart. No better to, than to think that you know better. Do it for love. Practice what you preach. Thank you. Well, I've been asked to entertain questions, and of course, I would love to do that. Um, and I guess we should get the house lights or something so I can see you repeat your question, read your lips, if there are any questions or comments. I can't even see a hand if there is a right there. <clears throat> Why speak English? You mean as opposed to Spanish? No. I mean English as opposed to, um, you know, architects' theoretical vocabulary. Um, I think often we tend to want to use, we've adopted another language as we get steeped into our architectural educations or our practice or talking about it. And uh, when, when we work with other people, we need to just speak English. Well, I, uh, the question was really about um, looking, working with a community and having a sense for the stability of that community and whether or not any realistic uh, projections or expectations can be made out of whoever is there at the time. Is that right, Vic? Okay, well, I think that um, we'd all be you might be surprised at how every one of the neighborhoods in Los Angeles or everyone that I've come into contact with has some core of, um, of, of neighborhood, of residents, of community that has been there, is there now, and is determined to stay. And I, and I think that their participation, along with acknowledging kind of demographic shifts and, and new uh, new residents and new businesses um, all gets in, stirred into the soup and, uh, a and can be, I think, still, still used to determine or to, I mean, you really, what you're translating anyway, but I think it could still work. And I think bottom line also is that when you go from community to community, people's concerns are basically the same. I, you know, nobody wants uh, drug dealers on the corner. Nobody really likes razor tape. Um, nobody really wants to feel afraid. Nobody really wants to walk in the dark at night. Um, people really don't want to drive 10 miles to the nearest decent grocery store. I, you know, there are some basics, although you don't want to just come in and say, yeah, I know what you need. You want a grocery store. You want, um, you know, lights on the street. But I, but there are some things that are just kind of uh, are consistent. Whether or not we're planning for growth, I think that really depends on the particular community. Really what we've addressed mostly and what our challenge has been is to look at 
an existing place that once was something larger or more or better, you know, however somebody wants to qualify it, than it is now. And it's, and it's looking at the shifts in how we live, like the effects of the shop, regional shopping center and things like that, and um, how we can now use what's there or reuse or adapt um, to kind of a different economic and social structure. I think, I think that there is an appreciation for the value of historic buildings or older buildings and certainly of design in general within every community. Um, actually, my realtor, when showing us houses said, you know, and knowing that I was an architect, said everybody appreciates good design. They may not be able to describe it or they may not know why, but they recognize it when they see it. And uh, certainly in Morningside Park, one of the primary interests of this community was to set some design and architectural standards before anything. And, uh, but what we were able to do by going and looking carefully at the area, we could see this rich, um, this rich stock of modern buildings and point it out to them and show them um, Art Deco buildings and other places that are fully restored or in their original state, and um, and and then suddenly they realize they do have an architectural heritage right there, and they do appreciate it. So it's a little bit of education, and then you know they can take that and and go with it. Anything else? I'm gonna go catch the last of Dateline. <laughs> Thank you.